My name is Neil Hambly, and I'm going to be introducing you to extended events if you haven't already come across this feature. So, a quick kind of throughout my slides, lots of information. The most important one on there is my contact information at the bottom. If you have questions about this session or generally about SQL Server, please let me know. I kind of like challenges, and uh, especially if they're SQL Server related. Um, I'm a past chapter leader for London and also a virtual chapter leader as well for professional development. And I do a lot of these events like single relays, single bits, international ones like the summits and conferences like that. And I think this is about my 127th session in the last four and a half years. So quite a few behind me at the moment. So this is what we're going to try and cover in the next 50 minutes or so. We're going to talk about extended events and kind of give you a guide as to what this feature is, how you might want to use this feature, and why it's important to kind of learn about this feature, because it's one of the things that's been deprecated in the current SQL Server kind of stack. So this eventually will disappear, profile will disappear, and extended events will become its replacement. So we're going to talk about kind of the challenges that this kind of produces for you in actually making yourself useful with this feature. So you can see from the session here, we're going to talk a little bit about what the feature is, kind of what its capabilities are, but then we're going to kind of jump into some demos and actually take you through the kind of capabilities of the tool, of the feature, and show you kind of what you can actually do with it today. So, let's get started. So first off, what is Extended Events? Quick show of hands, first off, who's actually used Extended Events before? So I'd say there's about kind of 10 or 15 of us in there, so maybe about quarter of the audience here. So, set of the events effectively is the kind of replacement for profiles, as I said. And it's a lightweight mechanism for understanding what's happening inside of the engine. So it's kind of baked deep into the engine. When events certain happen, when events are happening inside the engine, we can kind of fire um, information gathering about that. So there's payload information we can get. We can kind of trace this information or capture these events in a live window or to specific files, we can understand what that is. So first off, you can see, and it may, uh, let me kind of zoom in a little bit for this to see if we kind of give you a bit more clarity on it. Let's do a little zoom in. Notice in 2005, we had zero extended events. We had, didn't have the feature, but we had our trace capability. And we had 171 trace events available from profile or server-side traces. 2008 comes along, and now we have this new capability that eventually is going to be the replacement for profile. And we start off with a kind of fairly modest, I say modest, 243 different events we can trace. But it's not a complete kind of, everything you can do in trace uh, itself, you could actually do an extended event. So there was some new stuff, but there was some stuff missing as well. So it was a little bit kind of, uh, no, quite, no, not quite baked uh, fully at the time. And we went up to 180 different events that we could actually capture in, in Trace at that time. But notice, 2008 R2, 2012, 2014, 2016, going forward, no longer are we actually adding new Trace events that, into the profile of service like Trace. They stopped development <coughs> into that side of the tool. All they have done, is they've started adding additional capabilities of different events that we can capture. So these effectively are like new features, like always on, and other kind of in-memory technologies that we have added in those 2012 and 2014 releases. So the new stuff will definitely need to have extended events in order to trace that information. Profiler, we wouldn't have those capabilities of actually kind of looking at always on or some of those other capabilities. So, First off, depends on which version of SQL Server you're actually kind of working against. Be aware that there is now, from 2008, uh, from 2012 onwards, there's a full compatibility of all events that Trace used to be able to do, but there's additional stuff as well. So we're actually up to now, getting close to, I think, over a thousand events in 2016, for each set of events. It's a massive jump compared to what we used to be able to do. Let me zoom back out of that. These events can be triggered when we are tracking for, say, like a deadlock event occurs. We can capture that information. And I'll go through some of the existing system health 
session, which is the default session that gets created when you run the SQL Server, and it's up and running by default, and it captures things like you know, deadlocks and errors of certain types. There's a whole complex kind of array of different events that we can capture for. So we're going to go through some scenarios about what kind of things we're doing for. But it's very lightweight. It's so basically, <coughs> I think they show 20,000 events per second on one of the old kind of two gigahertz, one gigaram system would take two CP, two uh, percent of CPU. This is a very low kind of overhead for that system. There are some new terminologies that come along with this. So the things we're going to be talking about is a session. Now, effectively, a session is just a com kind of configuration file about what it is I'm interested in and want to capture when I'm doing this session. One of the great features about extended events is that when you compare it to kind of profile or trace, is that when I set up that original trace and profile of session, I set up what I wanted to look for, and then I start the session and I start capturing information. Oh, you know what? I need to add a bit of an additional kind of collection uh, event here. I've got to stop it, I've got to add it in, I've got to restart it, so I might have been missing events. So if you need to make changes on the fly, uh, make changes to your profile of session, you've got to stop and restart. With extended events, you do this live. You can go and add in new events, you can change your, your configuration, your filtering, the characteristics of your session. And in most cases, you will not need to start. There's a couple of cases where, for example, when you're changing some of the, the configuration settings about kind of how many events it will lose, for example, before you can carry on. Some of those do require a restart of the session, but it can be very quick. But also, you can save those existing events that you've captured into a trace file. You can change the modification. You can then merge those files later on together. So it's mo more or less likely to actually kind of lose events and be a tool you can use to kind of troubleshoot things live than you used to do with um, kind of the profile sessions. Package, this is effectively just saying what internal kind of object or packages they know, there's like four or five or six or seven of them in the later versions, do I want to capture this event from? So there's the SQL OS. There's a SQL package 01. So there's, there's kind of these names that we use that to find where those objects are kept, basically what the code library is that sits in the engine. An event is simply kind of that thing like statement um, completed. You know, the weight info <coughs> weights event uh, as an event. I want to capture that. I want to see what's there. Now, these events basically come with a, a standard payload, and we're going to go and show you these payloads and what information is captured from each of these different events, or not the whole 900 of them, because that takes a little too long. But we'll go through some examples. But there's another thing that you can capture, which is called actions, which is like an additional set of information that you're going to request when that event is captured. Maybe I want to capture the plan handle. Or maybe I want to capture the user ID. So we're going to go through some of these things that are sometimes not part of the payload, but additional information you want to capture. Actions, uh, sorry, targets are where do you want to put this data? Do I just basically want to have a set of memory buffers where I can kind of store the data while SQL Server's running? But later on, I don't really need to have that data. I don't want to persist it anyway. So that's one of the targets available. There's other ones like the histogram, which is, you know, show me a grouping of this information. I, you know, I just want to know how many times this event happened in this category, in this group. But others are file targets that are more persistent, like the asynchronous and asynchronous file target. So this is a file that you're going to store data in that maybe you want to keep between restarts of SQL Server. That's another benefit of actually extended events, is that because the session itself is a metadata of kind of collection of information, you're only capturing basically information when that session's running. And I'll show you kind of that they're normally in a stop state, and then you have to start them. But you can also start them on start from SQL Server. Great, SQL Server starts, my session starts, like the system underscore health session does. Now, Profiler, if you stop SQL Server and restart it again, you have to rebuild that Profiler session. You have to restart it. But all the information you had effectively was stopped. So here, I can kind of you know, keep that information between restarts in terms of the metadata. I just have to make sure that I 
go in and start that session. I don't have to recreate it inside of the engine. And the powerful one, predicates. This is the difference pretty, pretty much around kind of why this is so lightweight compared to what we had before. Now, basically, it's known as short circuiting in terms of predication. What that means is that, let's say that I want database ID number eight. Let's say this is the VentureWorks database. If the statement transaction didn't start in that database, I'm not going to capture that event because I basically said it needs to be from database ID eight. Let's say it has to be more than 10 seconds in duration. So if that statement doesn't exceed the 10 second time frame, I'm not going to capture it. As soon as I get a false positive on that short circuit, it's not going to fire that event. So let's say also it needs to be by database uh, from session number 56. Now if it's from 57, I'm never going to fire that event because it's never going to have that characteristic of more than 10 seconds from that database and from a session ID that I've specified. So it's only ever going to fire those events and send that to a target, one of the targets you've specified, a ring buffer, and you can have multiple different targets at the same time here. Whereas something like Profiler, the reason why we had that before was that we were casting lots of information, we were doing post filtering in most cases. So the workload was a lot higher for SQL Server to run. You know, I've taken down SQL Server, I would say on purpose, but um, that's just me afterwards saying that I deliberately wanted to do that. I've taken SQL Server down in terms of capabilities. I've, I've kind of overloaded it with CPU and other information because I was capturing too much information. Some events are so lightweight, it's kind of uh, that there's really kind of no overhead. And unless you start doing lots of those actions, start adding lots of actions in, that can simply add a lot more weight to that overhead. So, we talked about a bit of the terms. Let's have a quick visual kind of around the, the kind of components of this. So the packages, as I said, this was the original set of packages that came in 2008. The SQL OS, which is the SQL operating system. Then they have some really good naming conventions like package zero. Red, Microsoft, you're doing a really good job of naming things. You know, um, SQL Server, yeah, that's really useful because later on there's actually another one called SQL Server um, that has a completely different set of events in it. Uh, the events that what we said earlier are basically the things we're trying to get more information about. We're trying to understand what's happening behind that curtain. You know, why did I get that deadlock? Which session, which plan cache handle was that coming from? You know, so we can do that kind of analysis. Things like weight info, error reports, how many locks. So some of the examples I'm going to do is a, lo a locking, kind of blocking analysis on your system using Excel events. It's not even completed. Kind of stuff you used to be able to do as well with Profiler, but maybe not quite as useful and kind of as, as lightweight. One of the great things actually is any um, profiler sessions you have, you can kind of convert them into the equivalent kind of extended event session. So have a much light, lighter weight version, more controllable, more version, kind of more actionable in what you need to do. But it's kind of exactly what you started with in terms of the template. Actions, these are the things we talked about that actually are the additional sets of information. How many reads and writes occurred? What was the session ID? You know, and other useful information around that. Credit cuts, this is where we said we need kind of the where clause effectively for sending events in the sense of you know, where that happened. And then these are some of the targets we have. So the main ones would be the event file and the ring buffer. But you might have the history counter or histogram as it's known, then buffer tin pairing. Um, so there's a few different ones and they have different scenarios where they're useful. Event tracer for Windows, never really used it, it's available and kind of is something you might want to kind of use it from time to time. <coughs> I do apologize, I do have a bit of a cold, so I'm going to try not to cough too much. So, back in the, we have a question, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> so, is that, the question is, no target for table? Yes and no. Um, so the answer is not directly. You don't specifically take event, extended events information and drop it into a table like you would, for example, with profile. 
the data you get out of extend events is actually XML data, and you usually parse that. So there is a live window we're going to show, which is kind of similar to the, the viewing profile of view. But eventually, you probably put it into one of the event targets, like the histogram or the uh, memory, one of the memory targets, like the ring buffer, or you put it into a file and then process that information. You kind of process the XML. Then you might put that data directly into the table after you process it. So you can kind of store that information directly in, and I've kind of seen people try to do that. You probably want to process that data with, with some X queries first, and then put the output into the table structure later on. In earlier versions, we had kind of that black box trace, it kind of a profiler session that, that captured things like errors of certain types and other information. And this basically is the equivalent in Excel events, it's called system underscore health. And what we do, I'm going to kind of just go through some of, the, some of the things that it captures. And there'll be something in there that you kind of will probably think, oh, I didn't realize that was in there. Um, so we've got errors of certain severity. You know, you need to know when errors are happening in your system. And this is a great way of saying what those are. You can go and modify this set and add in additional errors if you wish. So if you say, hey, I also want to capture these additional errors, sure, go and modify the extended event session, system health add in some more ent entries. Mer memory errors, you know, certain things that are indicative of you know, memory problems, actually the memory being uh, not right. Who's ever come across a non-yielding issue? So there's a few kind of schedule type problems where things don't yield properly and get some error matches saying it's non-yielding. Maybe in the earlier versions of SQL this is more prevalent. In 2000, 2005 I came across this a few times. Um, so we get issues around that that we can capture. Ah, this is one actually that I think is a really useful way of kind of um, understanding. You know, deadlocks do occur. We, we do write bad code, or somebody else does, not us, obviously. None of you guys in here write bad code. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure if that's even about that. But um, <laughs> no, it happens. You as a DBA, you basically got a responsibility to say, you know what, I need to figure out when this has happened, I need to react to it. Now, if you had those trace flags on 1222 and 1225 and those stuff, you can kind of log it to an error log and go and kind of look at that information and go cross side by trying to figure out what all this information is. You probably want the deadlock graph. Well, this basically captures that deadlock graph. So this is a, a system health session starts when SQL Server starts. So the duration of when SQL Server has been running, you can see any deadlocks have occurred since that's the last restart. What, so let's say I want to persist that information over time. Well, I can also know of, I can log this to a file as well. I can create an additional session with the exact same deadlock information being captured. And that's what I often do in some cases. And I also capture the additional actions to say, you know what, which session, which user, which database, what timestamps, you know, all that information is available. So I can get additional sets of information, which plan handle, which plan am I looking at? But if we get deadlock graph and we can part it, there's a couple of uh, problems with some of the earlier versions in terms of the ring buffer where it stores this information about the size of the two meg. The graphs get a little bit too big and get kind of, you know, uh, broken a little bit. So there are a few fixes around for some of those, be aware around that. I've got lock weights of more than 15 seconds. Now you've got more than 15 seconds of locks, you have a problem in your system. No doubt about it. So you can kind of be aware that, you know what, well, these are kind of really significant problems. I'm keeping that information kind of captured somewhere. Preemptive OS weight types. Now there's preemptive weight types and there's non-preemptive weight types. The preemptive ones effectively is the Windows OS kind of doing some actions, doing some maybe a file group or some other stuff in the system. So you might want to be aware of what those are <coughs> and how to solve those. So that's the kind of, and that would be for a civic kind of 10 seconds or 30 seconds, I think, in this case. You might also be aware that 10 events is kind of baked into the engine then. So of course, you know, we have the on-premises version of SQL Server, the kind of full version, fledged version. But we also have SQL Azure, or Windows SQL Azure, or it keeps changing its name. Um, so I think it's called Microsoft Azure SQL database now. Um, 
every five minutes it changes. By the time we get out of the room, it'll be a different name, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> but we start having some capabilities. Now, we don't have the same overall capabilities we have. We have some default sessions that I, at the moment, I've not looked into the details about how to figure and change these. But effectively, these are ones that you can kind of spin up. How many query weights are we getting? You know, what is the detail? How many pre queries? So kind of these are the things that maybe you're going to get some information about what's happening. But be aware that there's actually these queries that you can kind of run, and these are the tracking, sorry, on the side, and these are the queries you can run. So these are kind of baked versions of this. You can't really kind of grow your own version at the moment. Hopefully that's going to change. So, who does backups in their system? All right, let's actually do that wrong way. Who doesn't do backups in the system? <laughs> okay, excellent. Yeah, I think that's it. All right, I want to see all your backups after the session. Um, you may have a large database, and you may also need to some point say, well, how far am I through this backup? So how can we do that today? There's a couple of ways you can probably do it. You can probably go and see when the files was kind of created. So you go into your file system and go, well, I can see the timestamp and I can see it's been running for seven minutes. And I know it normally takes 12 minutes to so go into the log and have a look. So I've got five minutes more to go. I can do that kind of analysis. That's assuming everything's kind of normal. So wouldn't it be good to have like a percentage, a query I could run to give me a percentage? Well, what is a backup? It's simply a number of pages that you are taking a copy of and storing it in a format. Totally compress in most cases. But if I know that database has 10,000 pages, and I know when I go and look at the information that I'm 6,000 pages in, let me do the maths on this. Well, that's going to be 60% of the way through. Okay, so I know how long it's been run in, I know 60% of the way through, maybe I can do some analysis on the end. Now, so if we can kind of track how many pages we're capturing, how many pages we've read, and how many pages we've written, we kind of know where we are. So we're able to kind of do some analysis. Now, I've got some more interesting demos, so I'm going to skip through this specific demo, because this was a longer session. And I will make all the demos available to you guys later on, so don't worry, you're not going to miss out on any demos. I just want to get to some of the more interesting ones. But there's some queries you can run that will just say, hey, I'm 30% of the way through. Refresh, 35%. Refresh, 41%. We know Microsoft, when they do that kind of You've got so much time remaining, and it's like one second, two weeks. It's like wait four seconds. It's like wait a minute. It's, it's, so this is not kind of the same thing. This is kind of counting pages and doing some estimates. So it's approximately one or two percent maybe out from where it is. But remember, it's a running process. So as soon as you get the information, the thing's gone by. It's done some more pages hopefully, and hopefully you have a very fast system. If not, go and speak to the guys with the fast storage system. That's like. Um, but this is an example of that system. Now, I did uh, 141,000 pages in 8.5 seconds so, on a laptop. It's got a couple of SSDs in there, and it's OK. It's kind of a reasonably spec one. It's kind of a little bit old now. It's about five years old. But this was the event work database, and you know, you had that. One of the things I kind of do want to probably show you as an example, and I will go through this now, is when we look at something like weight stats, so who's heard of weight stats by the way? Okay, if you haven't, weight stats very simply is a way of analyzing when you're waiting inside the system on what resource are you waiting for. You're waiting for a lot to be released, you're waiting for a daily page to be read into memory, you're waiting for you know some allocation of uh, some kind of resource like memory. These are the things that we kind of do to analyze how well that system performs. So weight stats is great because it does it instance level. I can say at the whole instance, oh wait a minute, I've got like 150 <coughs> databases on here. So how useful is that for that database and that query I'm running? Well, it's kind of not. It's kind of looking at the, kind of the, the 50,000 foot view and saying, well, kind of how things are looking down there. But if I want to go and look at the SIP query of the SIP database and figure out what's happening from that one, I need to look at an LA per, per session demo, uh, system kind of level. Now it's great, we've got a new capability in 2016, when it does get released, that actually is going to be per session information 
around the execution sessions and the DMOS wait stats. Right, we're able to see per session information about this. But up until now, the way we could do this is actually go and use that predicate inside of Excel events to say, you know what, let's go and capture the wait info, wait type. But let's put some predication on it. Let's say for database number eight and session number 56, go and capture the wait info. So it only then sends the information about the weights that are captured for that session. Great, I can now capture a session for the information, the weight information for just that. I can understand what weights are occurring for that session. So let's go and look at some examples. Hopefully my demos will still be running. I've had to time clock my system back to July to get this to work. But, uh, that's because I'm too uh, too lazy to rebuild my demos. No, I'm not. Um, I'm trying to put Hyper-B on as well, and it doesn't want to play uh, full music today. So uh, let's just get some. So I'm going to go first off to a 2008 version of SQL. Notice, right at the top, uh, just to kind of build this a little bigger. <laughs> Too big, it's a large. I have my lab. If you don't have a lab, build one Hyper V, VMware, whichever one you want to go with. Build a domain controller, active directory, and basically build. I've got a couple of versions of SQL 2008 R2, 2014, <laughs> somewhere, it's not on the system at the moment. I was in the Hyper V, I have 2016. I have my DBA console, so. Don't jump onto your boxes like I'm doing in my demonstrations and actually run queries. But because I've had to time clock it, the networking is not working, so I've had to uh, jump onto the box to get the management console up. And I have a 2014. I'm going to show you the differences between 2008 when it got first introduced and 2014, how uh, extended events is different in terms of its capabilities. So, first off, let me jump into this one and then we go to full screen so you can actually see what's going on. And I'm going to go to management and go to, okay, oh, no, don't have an extended events console. Great, so one of the great things when they brought 2008 out, by the way, if you weren't aware, is they gave you no user interface for it. It was all T-SQL, DDL statements. I can still create sessions. I can still do what I want to do, but I have to craft that SQL myself. Now, there was a very uh, useful Add-in that was created by Jonathan Cahayas from SQL Skills for seven events. So basically, you can kind of get this add-in, install it into Management Studio, build your sessions. Effectively, you probably don't want to create the output, the kind of DDL statement itself, and then kind of maybe make some changes and then run it. So it was useful, but this is one of the reasons why extended events wasn't kind of picked up by many people in the early days, because we had no graphical interface. No. So who does everything, and I mean everything, in just T-SQL? Who doesn't use GUIs at all? There's no one in this room, not even my, myself, and I love T-SQL, I love doing things by code. We all use the user interface because it's an easier way for us to kind of figure out what's going on. But I can run sessions in here. I can go and start a new query, and I can start writing some code, and they say no type of demos. Demos. I don't know why I ever say number type of demos. Um, but I can write some T SQL. But I'm not going to do this because it's going to take too long. So I'm going to open what I've already done earlier and I'm going to hopefully see if it's still there. So I did clear this up earlier. I'm going to the graphics. Oops. Later. I think I've cleared it up. Let me jump onto my other system and see if it's there. I think it's in the other one. Okay, I'll go over to my 2008 and 14 system. That's pretty much where we do. This is the one problem with 2008. Don't do GUI unless you install the add in for that. And I haven't done this on this specific system. So, what I'm doing, I'll jump out that one. What I can do though is I can go and create my session using the GUI, say in a later version, 2012, 2014, 2016. Create the session, create the code, tell that code and port it back. Now I might have to do a few changes to some of the uh, kind of mappings that happen in the background. Be aware that they have changed some of the mappings stuff in the background. But 
If I go to 2014, which I'm on now, it says that. Yeah, get out of the right uh, session. Go to my 2014 session. So this is where we now have the vault fund. So it's a uh, um, control to read it. So why I'm logging in, any questions at this time? Anyone awake? There's one person awake. Yes, sir. Can you actually, I know you said you can port the, the session over to 2008, but if you're running 2014 console on the 2008 database, can you look the like So if the event exists as an event in the 2008 version, the question is, can you port 2014 session back? So basically, when you, I'll show you the code of where we create the session. If the event name exists in 2008, then you'll be able to create that session and run that session. If the event doesn't exist in that code base, then obviously you're going to throw it out. So you can't like code something in 2014 like always oh, on and kind of yeah. go back to that obviously because it wouldn't exist as a feature. So you need to be aware around those kind of things. So what you do here, I'm just going to zoom in a little bit using my friendly uh, zoom capability. Okay, so notice I've got set events listed, obviously this is great, we have now a UI. I have sessions and then I've got a list of all the sessions that I currently have in my <coughs> SQL Server instance that I'm running. Notice some of the ones have a nice little green arrow saying we're running, and some have a little kind of red block, set or red down arrow rather, saying we're not running. So this is all the metadata saying this is the session, here's what we've got here. Let me expand a couple of those and show you some of the differences about some of the targets that we have available here. So I'm just gonna zoom out. So first off, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go down to the key one that you also have, and show you that we have, in this case, let me get into the right position, system health. I've got two targets. I've got an event file, but I've also got a ring button. Ring up is just so memory objects, and you can resize that. That's one of the things I do recommend you do is go into the event uh, system health session and you resize it to a larger size of uh, events here. And I'm just going to show you the properties. You get storage for this one, and you see on the ring buffer, basically, I've got a four meg size one. I've not resized this one, but generally, I would go and resize this for a larger one. But I've also got my event file, and this is basically a 25 meg file with five rollover files. So what happens is when it gets to that 25 meg, it's going to create a new file, and it's going to rename the old one. It's kind of like that rollover you do with the airlines kind of thing. And you, I want to add up to five here. <coughs> you notice I can easily kind of add in another different, excuse me, different target. Maybe I want to look at air match. I want to find those failed logins as an example. I want to look at histogram. Okay, I'm now going to base it on a set of buckets, and maybe I'm going to do it on a different field. So maybe uh, session ID or kind of database ID is an example of one of the things I might want to filter it on if I'm capturing that database ID as, a, as an entry there. Go to advance. Notice that we have at the top single event loss. This is the one I probably would expect you probably would keep with, and this is the default for this. Multiple event loss, okay, I can, I can lose a few more events. Invariably, you're not gonna lose events anyway, but be aware that kind of, if you configure it for no event loss, it will sit and wait and hold everything so it doesn't cap, doesn't lose any events. So if you've got a long stream of events happening, this effectively could take your system effectively down to a storm kind of condition. So be aware that if you do the, the, the no event loss and it's not recommended as stated there, that you kind of want to have maybe uh, a reason to do so. Memory size, maximum event uh, size, partitioning. I kind of don't really do anything on the partition, but you may have a big system. You may want to kind of break that out by different nodes, etc. And the batch, the latency. So basically, when the buffer's full, they will throw, 
or what the second duration is for listen here. So if you have it 10 seconds, every 10 seconds, maximum, it will throw out data to the buffer, from the buffers to the target. But if the buffers get full, it will throw them out. So this is kind of a, a if I've got a low kind of activity for this specific session, I'm still going to get a frequency of when it's going to throw these out to the target to, re to open up those buffers again. Because there's some internal mechanisms that actually are used to hold those events until it fires them out. So what events are we looking at? Well, first off, let me kind of show you that we have an event library. We also have one of the things which is really useful. Uh, let's say, for example, let's say I want to look at show bands. I just start typing in part of the name of the event that I'm looking for. Here I can see that I want to have a look at the show. Oh well, there's, there's three show plan events there in this example. Let's say I'm looking at locks. Here's all the different locks that we have. We have deadlock, we have deadlock chain, escalation. You know, if you examine escalations on your system, sure, I'm just going to put the events in for an escalation to figure out when that's happening, which sessions cause that escalation. These kind of things are useful for you to understand where we're going. So once we know what type, what are the ones we're interested in, we kind of go over to the interface, which is totally unresizable. Thank you, Microsoft. You are useful in, uh, in your demonstrations of. So let's pick one that has um, one of the entries here. You can even see I can't even kind of get full information on there. I'm just going to move this back a little bit to give you a bit more visibility about what's on the next one. Error reported. That's my event up. I have five. What is that? That's the kind of default payload that we're actually getting information from. But I have a credit card on it, because I have a little check mark against that. Well, let's go to figure. So <coughs> on error reported, if I just do this, there's my file. Raw stack, database ID, session ID, the SQL text and the TSQL stack. But we said we had a credit card. So the credit card, oh, wow, this is kind of like a useful, uh, Visual interface is like so. This is all these different error numbers. So severity twenty, or any of these different error numbers. So you can build up lots of complexity in terms of your kind of your credit cards. We talk about event fields. These are the payload. This is what you get. So it's like well, I've got my error number. I've got a message. I've got severity and state. I've got category and destination. I've got lots of information. But maybe there's some piece of information I'm missing. Maybe let's say I want to understand hmm, user ID or some other information, the session ID. So let me go back to the global fields. These are those actions and go, well, let's, let's order it by name uh, first and go a little bit further over. Okay, so we've got database ID, but let's say I want a database name. Let me bring that back in. Let me bring in the username. Oh, actually, I'll tell you what. Let me go and see what session ID is. Well, we've already got that information, thankfully. Um, but let's go and pick up something we don't have. The username there. The transaction ID. Transaction ID, that's going to be useful more for us to track additional information. So you can see there's a lot of information that's, that's available. Now, the global fields, the actions available on this, are dependent on which package you're coming from. But what you can do is you can mix and match events from different packages. So effectively, you've got a kind of co correlated view about what's happening. And there's some additional great piece of information. I'm just going to show you one right at the beginning here. Because um, this session has started, I can't change it, but I can change it if I do stop it. Causality tracking. I need to have a relationship about what events are related to others. So think about the life cycle of your query. You have a connection. It comes from an application from a user somewhere. It connects into it. It's doing some actions. It's connected to a database. It's doing maybe a creation of a database or creation of a table, populating data. I want to understand that kind of stack of actions that happen. So what I can do is I can click on the causality tracking and understand how kind of basically walk the stack effectively of what's happening. 
So I can figure out who was, the, you know, when I get this error here, well, which connection did it originate from? Which user? I can figure out where things are coming from. So this is a powerful capability. You try and do this in Profiler, and you'll go bold, you'll go bold, like I've been, uh, well, kind of figuring that stuff out. So XML, we're gonna come back to this in a second, but there's some really complicated XML X queries. And we don't have time to go through kind of all the syntax of X queries, but you can create sessions, and you can capture this information, and then you can kind of maybe go and figure out, well, I know this is a plan handle. I've got my plan handle ID because I've looked at extended events. I've got this output. Maybe I want to go and now query what's happening in the plan cache. So this is maybe where I'm going to start using information from the plan cache and do an analysis there. But what we're going to do here is we'll just give you some quick examples of some sessions and show you the output of this. So I, before we <coughs> came in, actually came in and I went, okay, let me go and look at information on the server. I'm go, going to run. There you go. We'll run a couple of times just to kind of generate some activity. Now, this had a certain number of seconds before this is going to push it out from the server to the target. So immediately I've now got my information and what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you some of the capabilities. So I've got all these different records. And you see here, um, you know, if I look through the activity IDs going through, there's a PFS page. There's, so I'm capturing information about what's happening underneath in the kind of event log. The expanded rows, kind of the deletes that are occurring. Well, let's say that I want to figure out what's happening. Yeah. I want to show this in the table now. I want to do a grouping by how many times these events have happened. Let me just stop this for a second and then jump on grouping. One of the great things about some events is you can actually do kind of analysis on the fly as you go. Let me do a grouping now. Well, I want to do it by the operation, obviously. All ah, right, okay, now, let me just bring the zoom in. Now, I've had 80 missions. I did that four times. I've got 80 inserts. So you can see kind of how you can start using this feature to kind of figure out, well, oh, how many inserts did I just do for that session? You know what? Let me kind of create a session that actually captures that level of information and stores that information. Now, you try and do this in non-extended event states. You're going to have to probably go into the BFM lock. You're going to have a look at that transaction ID. Question at the back, you have to be loud because I'm half deaf. Is there any kind of uh, way you can know what the limits of actions are or whether it's actually a okay. so so How many filters too many? So I didn't hear the question fully because I, I say I'm a little bit deaf, but it, how many actions that the system can, can, can put in? Yeah, yes. So and are you getting to that point where essentially it might be affecting performance? Sure. So Effectively, the question is around kind of the more actions you add in, the potentially that's going to add a performance penalty. You know, nothing's free. Now, today is a free event, but it's taking your time and effort to come in. Now, inside SQL Server, anytime we ask you to do something that we haven't, that it wasn't already doing, is an additional set of CPU buffers, memory buffers, uh, sorry, uh, CPU cycles, memory buffers, you know, other actions. So, yeah. Be careful with how many actions you add in. But one of the great things is, you can make these changes on live. You know, I'm gonna add an action in, because I'm trying to troubleshoot this. You know, I've figured out that problem now. Let me remove that action. I don't need that additional set of information now. I've got the payload is, is enough. This is quite lightweight, really. So kind of beware that, you know, just keep an eye on the CPU and memory. I, I, you know, I've stressed this system heavily as much as I could with the resources by kind of having 20 different sessions running with lots of kind of different collections. Probably in the case of about 100,000 events per second being collected on the system. And I ran up to about 5% CPU than I was before. So it's kind of it's very, very efficient. But more kind of data you collect in the process and definitely is going to. So turn off these sessions where you don't need them. One of the things I also have is when I control it is I have the sessions kind of standby 
They're ready to go, but they're in a stop state. When I need them, I turn them on. But I could do that programmatically, programmatically as well. I can't speak with a code today. Um, I turn them on by code to get them running. So I can have an extended event session that goes, you know what, when this happens, I want to perform an action. I might put an entry somewhere that says go and turn on a different session. Let the data send me an email saying now our session's been turned on. I don't know if you saw an error log. When you had a trace start and trace stop, it recorded that information. Extended events doesn't do that. But you can set up a DDL notification trigger to say, tell me when the extended event session started and stopped. So you can do that, but you have to do <coughs> additional bit of information. Kind of keeping track of how much time we got, about 15 minutes left. Um, thank you. But I want to do analysis on this. But let me show you kind of some of the stuff you can do, which is really cool. Um, let me scroll that for a second. Filters. Oh, now I can do some timestamps on this. So maybe you can capture the information for an hour. For some of you worked out, know what, it's happened between 11.53.55.20 and 11.35.24, can't speak today at all. Now, let me apply that. Oh, I'm now down to 60 sessions instead of the 80. So be aware that you can kind of do this and you get a lot more advanced. You can do some aggregations, you can add in, um, you know, none of these have them, but let's say I'm just going to do a count on that, for example. Okay, so I've got a, a count here. So some of these analysis can be quite complex. You can save this analysis as well and actually have um, that. And then when I'm finished, no, I'm just going to clear open and off we go. Now, when I don't need the live demo anymore, now the session's still running in the background. What I did is I had a live window into the events. Remember we got, in this case, we have for this specific one, I have a single event file. So I have a file on my system. I can't remember where it is, I can go and look. But also I can go and just view that data. So immediately I'm reading that file and seeing the information. Now we can start doing some analysis on, on here, on the statement completed, for example. Yeah. So that's, the, that's one example of some of the things we can do. Um, potentially, I can actually bookmark specific events as well. So you know what, I'm going through, I've found something of interest, let me bookmark it, and then I can kind of, later on, I can go and jump back through the bookmarks of them. So it's a lot easier to kind of do your analysis on the trace information you captured later on. Let's kind of jump back to, very quickly, to, and here's an example where I'm saying if I wanted to use FNDB log, I could go and do that old analysis. What I found is when I use external events, I'm finding I'm probably two or three times more kind of performance and you know efficient in trying to just figure out where the problem is, coming up with the answers. For stuff that also I couldn't do previously in, in Profiler, I can now do. So I've got additional capabilities, but I'm probably figuring out the problem two or three times quicker than I was before. And there was one example where, when I was at uh, an architect for one company, and we had a pool of applications, and every now and then, things just kind of went wrong with, with this specific application, couldn't figure out what it was. What we found is we used the matching pair target, and we found that we had a login and a start, we didn't have an end for some of these events. So what we found is we were actually dropping, started, but we were never dropping the connection. What it was, it was one of the libraries, one of the, the dynamic limit li libraries, that on one server was a problem. So every now and then when that kind of server came to the pool, it was a problem. But we'd had this problem for 12 months and they couldn't figure out where the problem was. We used extended events to figure out that it was basically a drop connection, a lost kind of login. We took that server off because we figured out, well, it's server number 12. We took that one out, follow one away. We updated all the, we basically refreshed that server, recreated it, put it back in, problem then came back. The amount of support calls that they actually had, when we totaled that up, was basically about three weeks of total client kind of contact. So three weeks of kind of man time was lost. We 
because we basically had one server that had one old library file that wasn't quite right, that was dropping these connections, often in these, these transactions. We found that out for extended events. It took us seven minutes to figure that out, because I just created an extended event session. It was actually, I was doing a training session for the t DBA team and said, look, they would tell me one of your problems. They went, oh, we have this problem with uh, this, this user um, kind of reporting, kind of, you know, losing his connections. Oh, let's figure that out. And we did that, and in seven minutes, we figured out the problem. So it's a very powerful tool. If you're not using extended events today, this is something you might want to look at. Let me just jump over to get back out of the screen. Uh, get it. And jump back to here for a second. So I'm going to do the extended wait, the wait session, I'll bring that up in a minute. Uh, we showed the live view. This is a kind of a quick screenshot to say how complex it can get. So you know what? I want to look at, this looks fairly familiar to some of my profiles, doesn't it? That's kind of what I was trying to demonstrate here. You know, CPU time, duration, not <coughs> I can see the statement, the statement, I can see when it came in. I can see, actually we were having errors, and if so, what it was. And then I did my analysis and said, well, you know, how much time are each one of these generating? How many logical, well, maybe I've got a long running process. Maybe I want to filter by the number of logical reads. I'm only interested in statements that are generating a large number of logical reads. So I can do my analysis and then I can put the filters on. And I can, i say, give me ones with more than 20,000 logical reads, you know, too many logical reads, that kind of stuff. So here's a, a, I have 2014 on for some reason. Um, I think because I was unsure of the numbers and I was trying to get prepared. But I will add that to the deck and for 2016 as well. The number of actions has been increasing. The number of events has been increasing. So this is getting more and more advanced. Stuff we couldn't do before, we're now able to do. But also some of the events that we had earlier, they got some additional fields, columns, being added to them. Some of those might be you know, how much CPU and memory uh, is being allocated and used by that specific system. How many predicates we can actually have. Now, predicates compare, notice it dropped in 2012. So basically, they rewrote the engine a little bit and actually did some different things inside the engine. But it is more powerful, although you have less predicates in the uh, 2012 round than 2008 R2. <coughs> So let's go back to some more, more demos. I think I've got about five, about 10 minutes left. So let's go and look at some better examples of kind of uh, this. Let's say that I'm interested in database usage. How many users or how many people here have one database on the server? Apart from system databases, that is. What? Some of want to see this. Gotta watch out for these people. Um, can you use more than one on database? Um, that's usually the case. Uh, it's not access, by the way. Um, most databases have somewhere between 30 and 150 databases on average. Some have 1,000, some will have one, uh, or two, or three. The more, when you have more than one though, you're going to say, you know what, how is my breakdown by database? You know, how's my resources? Maybe you want to have an understanding when you're going to kind of need to split out a database that's really starting to be heavily used on that system and push it off to one side and put it on its own dedicated server. Well actually, you want to know, you know what, let's find all those small databases, so let's kind of put them onto a system that has, you know, um, certain resources, but I'll put my heavily used databases onto a more critical kind of infrastructure. So let's have a look at some examples of database usage. Let's look at the properties of this one. Let's also then script out what we have here. So this one, by the way, there are templates we can do. And I'm going to go through that in a second or two. I'm basically looking at the lock required. Also, you're not sure what an event type is. Let's have a look. It kind of tells you a little bit about what's happening there. All I'm doing here is 
I'm sending it to a histogram. And I'm breaking it out by database ID. Notice the maximum number of buckets. This is 32. The number of databases you have on the database will determine the number of buckets. So make sure you go and change that respectively to, if you have 200, make it 200. Um, you may not be using every database, but if you make that number smaller than the number of databases you have on your system, have fun with the results. Um, and don't come, uh, come sending me emails for it. Lock required. All I'm saying is, is every time there's a lock required on an object somewhere on that, just bucket into a data, into a bucket number one, number two, well, five, six, seven, eight, etc. You might have gaps because you've probably got database gaps, it's about ID gaps. And that's it. So what I want to do now is I want to actually go and say, let me look at the data. So again, there's going to probably be a bit of a time lapse for it to put into the live window. What I would do is to force it, I will probably go and run a couple of queries. So this is the transaction log demo. Um, let's uh, clean that one up again. Let me go and see if I have actually any data now. Mm -hmm. It does take a while sometimes to come through. <coughs> Hit it a few, a few times. This is when it goes a bit annoying. So it will come through eventually. Now, while it's waiting for that one, I will just go and see whichever ones I have ready. Monitor lock. And I'll bring up the live demo on that one as well. Hopefully this will eventually come up. Sometimes it does have a while to go through uh, before it puts it into the back of the uh, kind of the bucket. Here we go. Um, no, no one. So please, it doesn't want to send out targets today. Maybe it's because I've done something a bit weird. Let me kill that one and do some <coughs> more queries. So I'm just going to go up and I'm just going to start running a couple of queries from the database. Uh, there we go, eventually it eventually did come up. So we've got a database ID. So it's now starting to so let me let me bring that one up into it. No source I can go show that in the window. Okay, here's my database ID number red. Let me do my groupings. So I'm going to stop. Notice I can only do the groupings when the live window is stopping. That's not the event session stopping, that's just the live window. Now I can do by database ID. Now, on a live production system, you probably have a whole bunch of different IDs here. My database name as well, because maybe one of your adverts. But this is now going to tell you, and if you're doing a kind of, every time there's a, a lot required, you kind of get a correlation about how much activity one database has compared to the next one, compared to the next one. So let that run for a few minutes. This is a histogram. It's a very small kind of memory target, so a few kilobytes in size. It's going to tell you eventually over, say, an hour period. You know what? This database had 28% of usage. This one had 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%. Okay, you know what? This 28% maybe is something that has to be put on this home system. So this is the type of analysis you can do. Now, I've basically been asked a lot of kind of, can I do this, can I do that, can I do this analysis? I've probably not yet come across a type of analysis of what's happening inside the engine that I can can't do with seven events. So it's getting used to using the tool, using the capabilities. So we want to kind of quickly show you how to build up a seven event session from scratch in the two minutes I have left. So I'm going into sessions. You notice the wizard and new session. I tend not to use the wizard because it's actually a little bit restricted. Basically, I'm just going to go in and I'm just going to give this a name. But also, what I have is the capability of actually using a template. I can build a template, like I was able to build templates in the earlier version of profiling. Put them in there. Activity tracking. Let me say I want to do an activity tracking for a specific session ID. Let me go down. I'm going to pick that one. Oops, uh, pick that one. What's it done now? It's actually predefined the events that I'm going to capture. So I'm going to sit there and make all of these different kind of choices and filtering and predicates and everything else. I've got in. I want to go and configure this. I want to go and change the properties for um, 
some filter. So let me go and see what predicates we have on there. Uh, one of the final ones with actually filters on it. Come on, move over. There we go. So here I want to find all the odd numbers, or actually all the even number database IDs. And the object is a system object, and it's a, it's not, it's like a, uh, sorry, actually this one is database two. So I lied, database two. What's that, TempTP? And it's a system object. So it's greater, object ID is greater than zero, and it's got a hash in front of it. It's one of those temp and table structures. So this one here is effectively all of the objects that altered that were a temporary structure in tempdb. You can see how I can kind of build this up very, very quickly. But this is something I can kind of go and do, and I can make those changes. Um, but it's something I can easily do fairly quickly. Um, you know, I can kind of do this analysis really easily. You know. Let's say I want to look at the database ID. I go back and figure out, you know what, let's go to the database information, figure out what's happening. So this is telling me a lot about missing warnings, hash warnings, missing statistics, and guys that were unsuccessful, sort warnings, all that kind of stuff. This is telling me, temporary B, does it suck? How's it been used? We're not at the kind of end of the session here, so I kind of need to wrap this up now. Um, Two things I want to kind of say about extended events. You need to go and play with it if you want to understand it. So get your test system. If you don't have a lab, build a lab. Play with it. You will get up to speed fairly quickly with this. There is a bit of a learning curve when you first start using it. It looks all complicated. Once you start using it, build a few sessions, do a few demos, um, kind of try things out, you'll understand. Once you have that kind of understanding about extended events, you can now make yourself useful as a DBA or developer or architect to figure out what's happening inside your system. So this was a DBA guide to extended events. In a short 50 minutes, I'm trying to explain kind of what it's all about. The only thing I can really say is you need to go and figure this out. There's some great resources for you though. Anyone use Pluralsight? If you do, go and look at the SQL Server courses there's a couple on there around extended events. There's a basic <coughs> course and there's also an advanced course. There's a 31-day um, a or 30-day survey by Jonathan Cahayas that you want to also follow, okay? So we need to clear this now. Um, we've got another session to follow along. But please do uh, kind of you know, make use of extended events. If you want to speak to me afterwards, please do so. We have a lot of sponsors outside. Please make sure you also go visit those during your breaks as well. Thank you guys, it's been awesome talking to you, thank you.